Welcome to this edition of Theological Journals at 4.19 p.m. 6.29.22. We're with the Bibliotheca Sacra, an article on the chronology of life, the life of Christ with the epiphany, with emphasis on the nativity and epiphany. He draws, a, that we're talking about the soul in wink, this celebrations in imperial rome he draws a contrast between the quadrine quadrennial games for soul which he characterizes as relatively new and that an annual festival which he ascribes to numa in 42 3 lastly he states the annual festival in honor of rebirth of the sun takes immediately place after the saturnalia gives a convoluted and quite fictitious explanation for why it is held a few days after the solstice rather than on the solstice itself. Clearly, Julian is speaking of two different festivals of the soul, the one reportedly old, annual, and celebrated after the Saturnalia and before the new year. If the annual celebration was held on December 25, following the solstice, then the quadrennial games must belong to some other date, since that leaves only the games held in October 19 to 22. It is obvious that the Aurelian instituted, not those of December 25. Julian's claims date back to Numa is dismissed by Hijmans as a piece of fiction intended to give an ancient province, provenance to what was apparently a relatively new festival. In his words, the notion that the Mithraists celebrated December 25 in some fashion is a modern invention for which there is simply no evidence. Indeed, Hingemans even goes further as to speculate that December 25 was adopted by pagan authorities in response to Christian celebration of Christ's birth on that date. The upshot is that although there is evidence for the Christmas date in Rome as early as 336 AD, there is no evidence of a festival to Seoul on December 25 earlier than the chronograph of 354, according to Hingemans, as to the Christian celebration of Christmas on December 25 can be attested in Rome by 336, at which point it may already have been well established, and the celebration of Seoul on that day cannot be attested before 354-362 and has not yet entered the calendar in the 320s. It is impossible to postulate that Christmas arose as a reenactment of some solar festival. This, there is simply quite not one iota of explication for a major festival of soul on December 25 prior to the establishment of Christmas nor is there any circumstantial evidence that there was likely to have been one. Some techno mumbo jumbo. We're in modern reformation. The May-June edition and re-imaging or reimagining, uh, Restoring Eve by Deborah Call. At the heart of the bait is Genesis 3.16. To the woman he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very se severe and painful labor you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. In evangelicalism, Genesis 3.16 rests at the center of debates regarding the role of women in church, home, and society. And interpretations are often shaped by preconceived ideas about the nature of men and women and their roles. A particular significance for the debates is the interpretation offered by Susan Foe. 
in the midst of second wave feminism in 1975, followed to find the woman's desire in Genesis 316 as a desire to possess or control her husband, to contend with him for leadership in their relationship. In her study of the Hebrew word translated desire, Shakua, which is found in Genesis 3.16 and 4.7, and Song of Solomon 7.10, Foe uses etymology to build a semantic range for this rare word, arguing that cognate evidence supports desire having an adversarial nuance. She corroborates this proposal by drawing out the parallels between 3.16 and 4.7. In Hebrew, these verses are exactly parallel, except for changes in the person and gender. As a result, Foe considers Genesis 4.7 the interpretive key to 3.16, despite the preference by other commentators throughout history to associate Genesis 3.16 with the Song of Songs 7.10, <coughs> since they both address male-female relationships. She argues that the meaning of Genesis 4.7 is straightforward. Sin's desire is to enslave Cain, to possess or to control him. But the Lord commands, urges Cain to overpower sin, to master it. According to Foe, this clarifies what is unclear in 316. Like sin, the woman desires to possess or control her husband. This has implications for the interpretation of the husband's rule as well. Foe holds that the husband's rule is positive, a necessary corrective to the woman's attempt to usurp her husband's authority. As Cain needs to master the sin seeking to destroy him, so the man must rule the woman if he can. Her interpretation presented a solution to many conservative evangelicals searching for a way to respond to the feminist movement of the time. Feminism has infiltrated the church, causing many to question the time-honored interpretation of passages involving manhood and womanhood, gender roles, and their implications within the church, home, and society. The impact of her interpretation has been far-reaching for evangelicals. Foe offered insight into the feminist movement, even arguing it made biblical sense. She isolated the cause, a woman's inherent desire to usurp authority and others applied her work, stressing submission for women and the biblical womanhood. Over 40 years, Foe's view has become the standard interpretation of Genesis 3.16 by evangelical scholars. It has even made its way into the ESV translation. What once read, your desire shall be for your heaven, husband now reads, your desire shall be contrary to your husband. The fact that this argument is both polemical and biblical is what makes it complicated. Foe and the complementarian pastors and theologians who have followed in her footsteps have moved from reactivity to genuine conviction. She has persuaded many by her arguments, so much so that the arguments no longer need to be made. Primed by our cultural movement to believe they are true, we read our revised Bible translation and don't give it a second thought. We turn to modern Reformation again, July, only this is the July-August edition. And we turn to an article by William Twiss. The Collocutor to Westminster Assembly, the Scripture's sufficiency to determine all matters of faith. William Twiss, 1578 to 1646, wrote this work during his time as Prolocutor of Westminster Assembly, 
from 1633 until his death in 1646. This was his reply that had been anonymously written and sent to the assembly from Germany entitled A Perplexing Question and Doubtful Case of Conscience. Though the letter came claimed to have come from a Protestant in the Netherlands, the assembly suspected that it had actually been written by a German Jesuit feigning a question of conscience. Twiss's reply was posthumously discovered and printed in 1652 on the recommendation of Joseph Hall, Bishop of Norwich. In the section of the letter just prior to the portion here republished, Twiss had concluded that although the author of the subversive late letter frames the question as whether we can have any certain faith by the Holy Scripture, the real issue is whether it be possible for us by Holy Scripture to have any certain assurance of the meaning of it. The following excerpt of Twiss's response, therefore, takes up the scripture, the subject of scriptural interpretation. But it may be that this author, though the confusion of his wits, hath not hitherto been so happy as to deliver himself fairly of his own meaning. Therefore, let us take notice of the discourse itself, whether it may be bear any better state of the question than yet have we have been acquainted with. For I guess that in the issue, the state of the question will come to this, whether it be possible for us by the Holy Scriptures to have any certain, sure, assurance of the meaning of it. Discussion. The reason of our doubting is this. Both Papists and Calvinists holding contrary opinions do maintain, proved by the Holy Scriptures, they suppose, the contrary to that which the Lutherans hold, seriously affirming that in the Scriptures the Lutheran religion is condemned and there is confirmed, which thing no man will deny to be an evident argument of the obscurity of Scripture consideration. The sum of all this is that the scripture is obscure. And that which the author would infer from hence is this. Therefore, it is impossible to be sure of the meaning of it, whereby now I perceive the perplexed question and doubtful case of conscience comes but to this in plain terms. Whether it be possible for a man to be sure of the meaning of scripture, the author maintains the negative. And proves it because the scripture is obscure and the obscurity of scripture he proves by this that men differ in the exposition of it take that up next time as we turn to calvin theological journal gerard siskar on the beatitudes in the life of the church I've been working on the beatitude blessed are the poor. They made injustices with God's justice. They are persecuted because they live out of the justice of God's kingdom. That such people would be persecuted is easily demonstrated. Imagine a son in a family of well-to-do landholders in Galilee of Judea begins to give with generosity laid out in Matthew 6 19 to 34 to those described in the first beatitude the parents and siblings of this son would undoubtedly question the reasonableness of such actions and might even feel threatened by them might this explain Jesus's declaration that his coming would not result in peace but a sword referencing the conflicts it would create in family relationships, 1034 to 36. That section ends with a promised reward for everything done to one of these little ones, right down to offering even a cup of cold water. What is the justice, Dikai Sune, when a 
account of which these disciples are willing to be persecuted. Again, it is helpful to consider its use in the Septuagint, where it predominantly translates Saraka, which is variously translated as righteousness and justice. Saraka and Mishpat, most commonly translated righteousness and justice, are paired together in a couplet or parallelism so frequently in the Old Testament that it would be hard to imagine a Jewish person in Christ's time who would not see the concepts intricately intertwined. According to the Concise Dictionary of Classical Hebrew, Sedekah included the idea of social justice. Though not nearly as common, Dikais Hune was also used to translate the word chesed, the word often used for covenant faithfulness or loving kindness. Through being drawn into covenant terminology, the word dikaisune was supplied from time to time with content which is related to that of mercy when translating Seneca. Seneca Zabilski, in his thorough treatment with the meaning of righteousness in Matthew's Gospel and the Beatitudes in particular, demonstrates that righteousness for Matthew is not an eschatological gift, but is man's conduct in accordance with the will of God. His righteousness is often understood solely as a gift from God. I prefer the translation justice, as it more clearly communicates just actions which are righteous. We shift now to Westminster Theological Journal on Social Trinitarianism with Tory Trier. The third article, Theology and its Historical Overview. Karl Barth once suggested that one could begin the entire theological enterprise by starting with the Holy Spirit, and many have since followed his suggestion. Looking at Roman Catholic scholars, Hobbits mentions the massive and influential work of Yves Congar, Hilbert Meehan's Proto-Spirit Christology, and Ralph Cole's and David Coffey's significant contribution to spirit Christology. Surviving, surveying Pentecostalism, Habits discusses the labors of James K.A. Smith, Veli Mati Karkaman, and Frank Machia. Representative of Protestantism is Clark Pinnock, dealing with liberation theologies, Hobbits, engages with feminist theologians Elizabeth Johnson and Susan Coakley. Finally, concerning Eastern Orthodoxy, Hobbits looks not at certain figures, but certain features of the tradition that are conducive to third article theology. Basel of Caesarea's notion of the spirit as creator and perfecter. The 2016 multi-authored volume, Third Article Theology, then represents the first concerted effort to present and apply a theological method that starts with the spirit. We turn now to Mid-America Theological Journal. And we are with Dr. Cornelius Venema. Should effectual calling and regeneration be distinguished? His regeneration having a narrow and wider meaning. Because the work of the Spirit ordinarily takes place through the ministry of the means of grace, the proclamation of the gospel of the word and sacraments, Reformed theologians generally agreed that effectual calling, regeneration, and conversion must be viewed as inseparable aspects of the Spirit's work in drawing the elect into union with Christ. In the broader sense of the Spirit's work with the Word, 
Regeneration is not an immediate act, but a immediate act that takes place through the instrumentality of the word. However, even though the language of regeneration was used in the broader sense, there was a consensus that the Spirit's work in effectual calling through the word includes a direct act whereby a new life is granted to those who would otherwise remain dead in their trespasses and sins. In order to provide a context for my consideration of the proposal of Van Hooser and Horton, I want to begin with two illustrations of the traditional reform view of effectual calling and regeneration that are especially instructive. The first is the confessional summary adopted at the Synod of Dort early in the 17th century, 1618 and 19. The second is the formulation found in Francis Turretin's Institutes of Electic Theology later in the 17th century. Consistent with its aim to offer pastoral consensus statement of Reformed theology, the canons provide a less scholastic summary of Reformed teaching on the work of the Spirit and effectual calling and regeneration. Turretin also aims to offer the consensus view of Reformed theology, but his treatment is more scholastic in form. Effectual call 1.2, Effectual Calling and Regeneration in the Canons of Dort, Confessional Codification. In the arrangement of the five points of the Canons of Dort, the topics of effectual calling and regeneration are addressed in the third and fourth points of doctrine entitled Human Corruption, Conversion to God, and the Way. <clears throat> it occurs. <clears throat> the authors of the canons chose to treat these two points together, since the crucial difference between the Reformed and Arminian parties did not emerge at the third point, which deals with human corruption and inability, but at the fourth point, which deals with the way the Spirit works in effectual calling regeneration and conversion. The Arminian or Remonstrant view acknowledged the radical depravity of fallen sinners and their need for prevenient, sufficient grace to enable them to respond to the gospel call. However, it did not affirm that God's grace alone grants this response. In the Arminian view, God's grace precedes, enables, and is sufficient to make a response possible, but it stops short of granting what the gospel requires. In the Arminian view, God's grace grants all lost sinners the freedom to do what the gospel call requires, but this freedom also includes the power to frustrate God's gracious will to save those whom he calls. Accordingly, in the fourth point, of the canons, the heart of the difference between the Reformed and our many viewpoints on election and salvation comes into sharp focus. Does the salvation of lost sinners ultimately depend upon their free, independent, and persistent decision to believe and repent? Or does the salvation of lost sinners depend upon the effectual ministry of Christ's Spirit who graciously and powerfully draws and preserves those whom God elects into communion with Christ. The burden of the fourth point of doctrine is clear. Those whom God unconditionally elects in Christ are effectually called through the invincible working of Christ's Holy Spirit and Word. We turn now to global Anglicanism prayer after communion in the discussion in place of the images of the atonement. All language of our making a sacrifice is reserved for after we have received communion. 
the prayer of oblation whereby we offer ourselves as living sacrifices to God. His position is a post-communion prayer. This was deliberately done by Cranmer so as to emphasize that this is a response to Christ's work and not to be confused with the grounds on which we approach God. As Null observes by repositioning the prayer of oblation, the community's sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving was their newly empowered response to God's grace at work in them, not its grounds as previously. God's imputation of righteousness to us by Christ's atonement prompts this response in us. The moral exemplar model takes a prominent role in the service at this point in that the liturgy is clearly designed to lead us to gratitude that comes from the assurance of salvation, which will inspire a reciprocal love for others based on Christ's example. Null notes that just as in his doctrine of justification, the supernatural action in Cranmer's communion service was the renewal of the communicants' will to love Christ and one another, and all because they had first been loved by him. One of the alternative prayers after communion also focuses on reconciliation, which God has brought through Christ together with the victory he has won. In this prayer, the president emphasizes the reconciliation with God as Father. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son and brought us home. Keep us firm in the hope that you've set before us, so we and all your children shall be free. Moreover, Christ has opened the gate of glory through his dying and living and declared your love and great and give us grace. I just want to check something here. We are in the spring edition. Moreover, Christ has opened the gate of glory, and through his dying and living, which declared your love and gave us grace, this refers to Christ's victory as he triumphs over the powers of sin, the world and the devil to open the gate of glory to his followers. Whilst the victory image is not at the heart of the service, we're undoubtedly reminded of Christ's work in terms of victory through the words of the liturgy. It is important that believers be reminded of the victory aspect of Christ's work and that they can respond by rejoicing in that victory. We now turn to the fundamentals in faith uh, with Dean Heisen dealing with the Graf Felhausians. Another serious consequence, no final authority of the higher critical movement, is that it threatens the Christian system of doctrine and the whole fabric of systematic theology. For up to the present time, any text from any part of the Bible was accepted as a proof text for the establishment of any truth of Christian teaching, and a statement from the Bible was considered an end of the controversy. The doctrinal systems of the Anglican, the Presbyterian, the Methodist, and other churches are all based upon the view that the Bible contains the whole, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. See 39 Articles of the Church of England, verses, Article 6, 9, 20. They accept as an axiom that the Old and New Testaments, in part and as whole, have been given and sealed by God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. All the doctrines of the church from the greatest to the least are based on this. All the proofs of the doctrines are based also on this. No text was questioned, no book was doubted. All scripture was received by the great builders of our theological systems with the unassailable belief in the inspiration of its texts, which was the position of Christ and his apostles. 
But now the higher critics think they have changed all that. They claim that the science of criticism has dispossessed the science of systematic theology. Canon Henson tells us that the day has gone by for proof texts and harmonies. It is not enough now for a theologian to turn to a book in the Bible and bring out a text in order to establish a doctrine. It might be in a book or in a portion of the book that the German critics have pro proved to be a forgery or anachronism. It might be in Deuteronomy or in Jonah or in Daniel. And in that case, of course, it would be out of the question to accept it. The Christian system, therefore, will have to be readjusted, if not revolutionized. Every text and chapter will have to be inspected and analyzed in the light of its date, origin, circumstances, authorship, and so on. And only after it has passed the examining board of the modern Franco-Dutch-German criticism will it be allowed to stand as a proof text for the establishment of any Christian doctrine. But the most serious consequence of this theory of scripture and inspiration of the Old Testament is that it overturns the juridical authority of our Lord Jesus Christ. Very, very nice. Now we turn to Dr. Mike Reeves on theologians you should know. And we talking about the shepherd of Hermas and the visions. Four more visions follow the most important of which concerns the tower built on water. This represents the church built on baptism and reveals what a high view of baptism has started to emerge in certain Christian circles. It begins to clarify a main concern of the book and what was clearly a popular concern of the day. Is there a possibility of forgiveness after the washing of baptism? The answer given is yes, but only one possibility, for there is only one repentance for God's servants. It was this graceless belief that fueled the practice of postponing baptism until near death. The sorts of things Hermes sees in the vision are angelic builders removing stones from the tower indicating the removal of believers for sin and round stones that do not fit, representing rich believers who must first have their riches chopped off before they can fit into the tower. Next comes 12 commandments, all largely pragmatic and moral. The sixth contains the crudest statement of salvation by works prior to the arch-heretic Pelagius. Now here, he said, about faith, there are two angels with a person, one of righteousness and one of wickedness. This commandment explains the things about faith in order that you may trust the work of the angel of righteousness, and that doing them you may live to God, but believe that the works of the angels of wickedness are dangerous. Surely, however, the oddest commandment is the tenth. Clothe yourselves, therefore, with cheerfulness, which always finds favor with God and is acceptable to him, and rejoice in it. For all cheerful people do good things and think good things and despise grief, but sorrowful people always do evil. One wonders how the apostle would have reacted, confer Romans 9-2, for this is nothing like his liberating theology. Of joy. We'll pick that up again as we turn to Princeton Theological Journal and Shirley's little argument against the Anselmian view of the atonement. Although Aquinas does attempt to lay the act of paying the price of sin at the feet of Christ the man in order to maintain his alignment with the orthodoxy of his time, he certainly would not be disposed to separate the human and divine actions of Jesus 
to the point that one acted in a manner that the other did not. As a result, God in Christ pays the price of human liberation. To God in the Father, or in other words, God pays God. This notion is inconsistent with the very nature of God as love. If God remunerates God for the forgiveness of sin, sin was forgiven without payment of the debt. The imagery of God forcing Jesus to undergo immense injustice and suffering for the sake of an illustration contradicts our conceptions of a loving, just God. Does God set the stage and act out a horrendous travesty of human justice and excessive violence through the murder of an innocent man in order to reveal the extent of divine love and forgiveness? If so, we are left with the imagery of divine forgiveness through violence and injustice that not only permeates our perceptions of God, but also invades and influences our own behavior. Dissatisfaction with such an inadequate and disturbing conception of God leads to the search for more consistent models of divine forgiveness that are not founded on retaliation and retribution but on the basis of creating a new relationship that forgives without the violent economics of exchange. The parable of the forgiving father in Luke 15 gives us a relational motif that casts doubt on the idea of exchange. The father in the story is satisfied merely with his son's return to him. He does not first demand the son repay the money frittered away on careless living. In fact, he refuses to admit to any debt on the son's part at all. He covers him in a loving, forgiving embrace and receives him into the fold. John Caputo helpfully articulates the liberality of the father's forgiveness. In the story of the prodigal son, the father does not sit down and calculate just how much suffering he should inflict upon his errant son. For his prodigality, but his prodigal with forgiveness. Indeed, the idea that seeing the son suffer would in some way constitute a payback to the father would clearly be abhorrent to the sort of father portrayed in this story. In accordance with just such a view, Gorge theorizes that our sin is forgiven prior to the passion and is forgiven in the name of God who seeks life for all his creatures. Guilt is shriven, not expiated. We bring that to an end as we turn to a new article, What Happened? To liberalism by Matthew S. Miller of the C. S. Lewis Institute, Greenville, South Carolina. As a formal movement embedded in mainline seminaries and denominations, American Protestant liberalism has been on the retreat for bet the better part of two generations now. Outflanked by more progressive stamp strands of liberation and postmodern theologies on the one side and a resurging conservative Christian orthodoxy on the other. Liberalism's once commanding public voice has been reduced to a pleading whimper. Protestant mainline denominations, once the mainstay of American religion, have seen their numbers steadily plummet. As of 2017, self-described mainline Protestants composed just 10% of the American public, a statistic further diminished by the fact that these barely a quarter actually attended church. By such measures, liberalism appears to be dead or nearly so, but is it? If we equate liberalism with its institutional form, 
the kind that took up residence at Harvard in the 19th century, put forward nationally renowned theologians who labored to make Christianity credible to the modern world, published leading journals and Sunday school curricula, shaping the thought life of a generation and was heralded by celebrated pastors like Foster. Then the bell tolled for liberalism long ago. In his massive trilogy, Tracing the History of American Liberal Theology, Gary Dorian relays the accepted narrative. In the 19th century, it took root and flowered. In the 20th century, it became the founding idea of a new theological establishment. In the 1930s, it was marginalized by neo-Orthodox theology. In the 1960s, it was rejected by liberation theology. By the 1970s, it was often taken for dead. We would be mistaken, however, to equate liberalism exclusively with its established institutional form. Just as we would be mistaken to equate Gnosticism singularly with the official movement of self-styled Gnostics that early Christianity defeated. Though the published work of Gnostic theologians were entirely lost long ago, the impulse of their thought has persisted to the present day, as Philip Lee and others have demonstrated. In the same way, liberalism in its institutional form has suffered an outward defeat, but that does not mean liberalism itself has been vanquished. The heart of liberalism has proven to be not its institutions, but its ideological core. That core was clearly identified by J. Gresham Machen in Christianity and Liberalism in which Machen pointed to liberalism's number one, naturalistic approach to religion, two, appeal to human experience, and ultimately individual experience as a final authority, and three, exclusively imperatival message. On this last count, liberalism jettisons the grand indicative of the gospel that is the announcement of the great things God has done in Christ for sinners. Think Romans 1 to 8 or Ephesians 1 to 3. And is thus left to traffic exclusively in commands and aspirations, imperatives. In one of his most profound statements, Machen announces, here is the most fundamental difference between liberalism and Christianity. Liberalism is altogether in the imperative mood, while Christianity begins with the triumphant indicative. Liberalism appeals to man's will, while Christ denounces first a gracious act of God. What happens when we look for liberalism's ideological core of naturalism, the authority of experience, and the imperatival mood? We find that liberalism has outlived the decline of its institutional citadels. Notre Dame sociologists Christian Smith and Patricia Snell write a historical nemesis of evangelicalism. Liberal Protestantism can afford to be losing its institutional battles now precisely because long ago it effected, effectively won the bigger more important struggle over culture. Put another way, if institutional liberalism is effectively dead, ideological liberalism is more alive than it ever has been. Where do we find that? We'll pick up one more here with Concordia Theological Review on Confession. Should I let that confession lapse? Confessions, no matter their ancientness or resonance with us, remain second-order reflections on the content of God's Word. They do not tell us what God's Word means. 
confessions claim to be an exposition or correct exhibition of scripture. The Lutheran confessions have what some might consider a naive view. The scripture speaks for itself and does not need wild exegetical gyrations through which a text can be tortured until it hands over its meaning only after the ex exercise of our exegetical prowess. Otherwise, the Bible could not be a saving text that the humble, meek, and untutored could study and apply to their own salvation. As the psalmist says, the unfolding of your words give light. It imparts understanding to the simple. Psalm 119, 130. I wonder at the level of exegetical complexity being set forth by many exegetes. I am troubled by the amount of making simple things complex that is required by the academic enterprise, which is not always to the benefit of the church. In this sense, the content of both the Bible itself and our Lutheran confessions is quite simple, granting light and understanding to the sinner. The Lutheran confessions claim derived authority an authority drawn from scripture. The authority makes it norma, normata. This means that the confessions bear the imprint of the scriptural truth. They are an antitype of scripture. Scripture is the divine stamp. The, question, the confessions are the coin pressed into the right shape when struck. The coin bears the marks of the original stamp. Robert Preuss says that the means that this means that the symbolic writings become for me permanent confessions and patterns of doctrine. This must be my confession held with my whole being. The Lutheran confessions are not merely a personal confession, although they are not less than that. They are and remain the confession of the church. This is true because the confessions purport to convey biblical truth. The church remains the church because God has spoken. She does not have an independent authority because she is the church. That would be the Romanist heresy. She is the repository of the truth because God has deposited the truth with her in his word, which delivers the work of Christ. Therefore, there are no merely denominational or organizational guarantees to the truth. There is only the church under the word of God. The confessions are above me as an individual. That's why Edmund Schlink says that the great consensus of which the confessions so often speak makes plain that the confession is not the doctrine of an individual but of the church. The churches and her pastors place themselves under the uniting confession of a shared expression of the faith. Both corporately and individually, we freely place ourselves under the authority of these texts because we must. We are freely compelled by the authority which they convey. The truth obligates us to an amen of agreement. Of course, we may also freely reject their content, but in so doing, we are abandoning the scriptural truth. And here we'll draw this to a close. The Lord be for us, who can be against us. Godspeed.